So we're going to start out with uh, a presentation by uh, Dr. Christopher Lant, who's a full professor in the uh, SIU Department of Geography and an expert on water resources management. We really appreciate you coming in today, Dr. Lant. Thank you, sir. Okay, well, I'm not a, an expert really on fracking. My, my um, expertise is in water resources, which uh, always seem to relate to either agriculture or energy resources, which uh, makes my field natural resource systems, really. So what I'm going to present is uh, Jackson County uh, fracking in, con in context. Um, and this is a, a national uh, phenomenon here of, of fracking for shale gas. Uh, this short, uh, this diagram that I put together a couple of years ago based on 2006 data from the Department of Energy shows the energy supply of the United States uh, on the left and the energy uses on the right. Uh, the issue of fracking uh, really relates to increasing domestic production of oil and to a greater extent gas, uh, which could potentially replace uh, other sources of energy in the United States, and there have been substantial increases in domestic oil and gas production uh, since fracking began. Uh, this is important nationally because of, you know, who has the oil uh, in terms of world oil reserves. Uh, and so it is an issue of, of, of uh, domestic energy security. All right, um, what is oil and gas in, a, in its geological setting, this particular diagram? Uh, shows that in the case of, a, of an underwater uh, oil and gas field. And what we would have here is um, a permeable reservoir of rock that contains groundwater, oil, and natural gas, which, which tend to filter out that way based on their density due to gravity of gas on the top. And the important part is this impermeable trap, uh, often made of shale that prevents all of them, the natural uh, gas and oil from leaking to the surface. And we've been producing oil and gas out of these permeable reservoir rocks for well over a century. Um, but things are changing now. Um, the conventional fossil fuels, especially oil, are becoming in shorter supply. And so new technologies are being applied to get at other, what used to be less desirable fossil fuels, including tar sands, also called oil sands, uh, especially from Canada, we've seen the Keystone Pipeline. Looks like there's a green light on that to bring in tar sands in vast quantities from Canada to the oil refineries of Texas and Louisiana. Um, in the case of shale gas, um, what we have here is uh, a lifespan curve for conventional oil reserves. Some people talk about peak oil. There's a, a debate on either side about that. Uh, natural gas being a finite resource would also have a finite lifespan, shale gas has the potential to extend the lifespan of natural gas resources uh, well into the latter part of the 21st century. Now where is the shale gas? This is a map of shale gas plays in the United States or geological strata that have shale that's full of methane and other gases uh, that constitute natural gas. Um, the big boom has been in the Marcellus Shale, uh, which you can see on this map in the, in the stripes, uh, centered in Pennsylvania uh, and New York State. Um, uh, zooming in on the map a little bit here, we can see that the southern part of Illinois has a shale gas play known as the New Albany uh, shale, shale Bed. And that's what the interest of the companies has been in recent years, is bringing that New Albany uh, shale gas bed into play or into production. This map from a 1982, um, and, I, and I, I say it's 1982 because I don't know how much more recent research there has been on what the geology is, uh, shows the depth of this New Albany, or the thickness I should say, the thickness of this New Albany bed. Notice that it gets um, thicker as you go to the east. We're on the thin side, the western side of the New Albany Shale and where it is in context with our, our neighboring states. Um, again, from that 1982 uh, publication that I found this morning, I just got the call yesterday. Um, this um, shows the composition of the natural gas in it and its methane is about three quarters and, and other gases that constitute natural gas. 
Now the more, uh, most interesting part of this is depth to top of sample in feet and then shown in meters. Notice it's over 4,000 feet deep. Right? That's important because um, if we're worried about fracking contaminated groundwater, how close together geologically are the groundwater and the gas? In general, the deeper the gas, the less likely it is to contaminate groundwater, which where the wells tend to be much shallower. And so this is a relatively deep shale gas play, at least where these um, samples were taken in Wayne County. I don't know whether that depth applies to Jackson County. I haven't seen the geological uh, research on that. So with new technologies, uh, with hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, what used to be impossible which was to get oil and gas from, from that impermeable trap, often composed of shale, has now become possible. And it's long been known that most of the oil and gas are trapped in the shale, but through hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, um, there has been a boom in extracting oil and especially gas from shale. Um, so what is shale gas and, and what is fracking uh, is the next question. Um, it started in the 1990s in the Barnett Shale in Texas, and the combination of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling is what's made this possible. Um, hydraulic fracturing is a technology that's a few decades old. Decades old. Uh, what it involves is this, is if the oil and gas is in shale and it's not permeable so that the gas can't work its way through the rock to the well. Um, the solution that's been found to that is to fracture the shale underground by using a lot of pressure. And so they put uh, what's called slick water um, and sand and pressurize the well until the, the shale, if you picked it up in your hand, it's easy to fracture, it'll start to fracture underground. As the shale fractures, it creates fissures through which the gas can get and find its way to the well. It, it, or it uses a technology to create permeability that wasn't there before. Now this has been combined with a more recent technology, horizontal drilling. Until the last couple of decades, you drill an oil and gas well, you drill it straight down and that's all you can do. Now they can take that drill bit and work it around sideways and horizontally to work that drill bit through the gas play and then frack, you do fracking from there and that has gained access to the oil and gas in these um, oil shale beds. All right, so there's two sides to everything. Uh, benefits of fracking for, for shale gas. It's a domestic source of natural gas for electricity, uh, heating of buildings. Uh, gas is the dominant source of, of energy for heating buildings. It generates about a quarter of our electricity and potentially for use in, in automobiles. There's an increasing number of fleet vehicles that are running on natural gas and natural gas burns cleaner than other fossil fuels uh, um, with less CO2 emissions and very low levels of other pollutants that create things like urban smog. Unless, of course, the methane leaks to the atmosphere through sloppy operations, which is uh, something to take into consideration. And so U.S. natural gas production has been increasing due to this shale gas boom. Um, a similar concept of tight gas uh, which is gas that occurs maybe in, in sandstone and limestone areas that have traditionally been used but have been a low permeability and now can be artificially uh, fracked for, for gas as well. So we're looking at a, a, a rapid increase in domestic uh, natural gas production through fracking uh, operations that's expected to continue uh, for decades to come. Uh, oil imports have been declining uh, due to increased uh, domestic production of oil uh, from fracking. And so, whereas in 2005 the U.S. imported 60% of its oil, uh, now that's down to 45%. Right? So it is making a dent in the energy uh, independence issue. And I suppose uh, what a lot of you are here um, to think about is the risks of fracking. And they are, every energy production technology has environmental risks and, and fracking is no exception. Um, contamination of groundwater is a risk. Um, if you fracture a shale, okay, and methane will rise towards the surface because it's light, and if, it, if those fractures go all the way into a groundwater supply, the methane can leak it, uh, upward into the groundwater supply. 
And of course, this woman is uh, lighting her, uh, her tap water on fire if that happens. So that's a risk that really has to be avoided. Um, there's large water demand. Sometimes a lot of water has to be pumped out of the ground uh, to make the fracking possible. There's also the injection of what's called slick water. Um, slick water is, has chemicals in it that make the water less viscous, so it'll fit into the tiniest of spaces uh, underground. And you know, nobody quite knows what chemicals are being used to make the water slick due to regulatory loopholes. There's also waste disposal. Uh, what do you do with that slick water after you take it back out of the ground? What do you do with the produced water that's pumped out of the ground that's in the way? Also, by nature, fracking is the generation of minor earthquakes. And are those going to affect the surface and cause damage? So those are the inherent risks associated with this uh, developing technology. So uh, some broad questions to consider in this issue is um, where does shale, uh, shale oil and shale gas fit into, a, into America's energy future? Is fracking becoming a global technology? The United States is not the only place with shale gas and there's nothing to stop uh, these technologies from spreading uh, worldwide. Uh, moving closer uh, to home as we go through these questions, uh, are the risks of fracking and shale gas inherent to the technology or, there, or are they due to lax regulation? And that's the real issue I think is lax regulation. Um, can shale gas pre be produced safely? Um, are the environmental impacts greater or less than other, other energy production technologies, all of which have their <coughs> risks? As fracking increases U.S. oil and gas, what other energy is it replacing? Is it replacing oil imports? Is it replacing coal? Is it replacing wind? Um, third, uh, can the 90-year uh, supply of gas reserves that the U.S. now has through the new assessments of shale gas uh, be used as a primary uh, vehicle fuel? We would be driving our cars on it. That would have advantages. It would uh, lessen urban smog and oil imports. Um, does this make the U.S. cleaner and more energy independent? On the other hand, is fracking prolonging the fossil fuel era and therefore intensifying global warming, something that maybe a few people uh, are looking at after the last month and were before? Mm -hmm. National regulatory issues. In 2005, Congress, at the behest of the Vice President, exempted fracking from the Safe Drinking Water Act. So a deliberately created regulatory loophole uh, was generated uh, six, uh, seven years ago. Congress may address this soon, um, but until they do, uh, what do we do more locally? Uh, my point of view on it is that technologies that provide great benefits but have consequences that are large if you make a big mistake, such as airplane travel, nuclear power, and so forth. Uh, those technologies are, uh, are able to be implemented. Uh, flying is safe uh, because there's tight regulation. Um, the same could be said, for, for example, offshore oil drilling. And we saw a couple of years ago with Deepwater Horizon where lax regulation uh, was associated with a big mistake. All right, so is this, is what, is this what's needed for fracking? All right, at the state level, uh, given on, a, on several issues these days, the federal government's not providing the leadership, so the states have to decide what they're going to do. Uh, Pennsylvania has been the focus of the shale gas boom. Neighboring New York uh, had banned fracking until a month ago when they're now allowing fracking, but only in the counties that border Pennsylvania. All right, so different states are dealing with these issues in quite different ways. Um, the shale gas states need to address um, fracking regulation in the absence of federal solutions, and Illinois is a shale gas state. All right. Um, a question I have for the board is, should the New Albany counties, and we know where the New Albany, uh, it goes to counties to the east, Williamson, Pope, Saline, Hardin, and so forth are, the sh are New Albany counties. Uh, should they uh, band together and impress Springfield to start answering some questions about what the rules of the road should be? in terms of technological safety controls, uh, liability, and what are going to be the local benefits, uh, the benefits to local community where fracking takes place. In the wind boom belt, they have new schools and low property taxes, you know, because the communities are getting a lot of benefit out of this sudden energy boom uh, that's occurring there. Also, disclosure rules. 
Um, what should the, the, the companies that are fracking for gas have to disclose in terms of the chemicals they're using, the te technologies they're employing? Uh, those are, are, are issues for um, filling in this regulatory uh, a hole over fracking that's been deliberately created at the federal level. And so I'm just going to finish with the, the, the question that I suppose most of you are most interested in is do you want fracking in your backyard? I'm a geographer, we invented the, the acronym NIMBY, not in my backyard, and I think that's the issue uh, that you're facing. Um, Great, thank you, that's a terrific presentation. I have a question now. Mr. Um, I, I assume in your presentation you referred to shale gas and natural gas. Those are essentially the same thing. Yeah, shale gas is natural gas that's occurring in shale. And in the one diagram, that there was a something called the impermeable trap, yeah. which actually is the shale that's now being considered for. It's usually shale. Okay. Yeah. And shale is usually impermeable. Okay. The uh, New Albany shale is it? Is it in Jackson County? Yes. It, well, if you look at this map. Um, you can see it extends all the way to the Mississippi, so it does extend in the Jackson County. If we back up to that old publication from the um, here, uh, we can see it's thinner in Jackson County, which means there's less gas. Um, the, the, the New Albany shale plate is, is thicker east of us. Nevertheless, you know, there's producible shale gas in Jackson County, it would appear from this map. I, I presume the uh, New Albany shale and the Marcellus shale, and the, that they have different characteristics in, in terms of the amount of oil and gas that are trapped within those. Is that is that true? Of course. Um, what about the New Albany shale? Is, is it a uh, uh, is it as as uh, uh, productive, let's say, as the Marcellus shale? I, uh, I think the answer to that question is no, but I would have to say that I, I don't know what the, the estimates are, um, and I'm not sure you could find it if you look, because there's a lot of privileged uh, information, private information associated with that. And, and you talked about the Clean Water Act exemption. It's Safe Drinking Water Act. Or Safe Drinking Water Act exemption. Yeah. Uh, had had there not been the loophole created uh, by Vice President Cheney, what would have been different? How, how would that have uh, affected the fracking industry? I don't know the exact answer to that question. I, I think some of the issues are one disclosure, okay, so that the public knows what's going on. I think a second issue is technological regulation. Um, for example, what we saw with Deepwater Horizon and, and Shell did not employ all the safety technologies that it should have been. Um, regulation can insist that certain safety technologies be employed. All right. So that's a second issue. Uh, a third issue is liability. Okay. NIMBY, not in my backyard, can also mean how come I'm accepting all the risk and somebody else is making all the money? You know. So um, if there is an accident and that affects you because you're a neighbor, what's the recourse? Um, so those are, I think, some of the regulatory issues that, are, that have been deliberately left unresolved. And uh, are you familiar with or, or have an idea of what uh, regulations are being considered by the state of Illinois? No, I haven't had time to study that. But you know they are trying to consider some regulations, right? Yes, and, and, and I think for, for, for this county and the other counties um, in the New Albany region is what can you do to push Springfield uh, to develop reasonable rules of the road in a short time frame? Um, at the last meeting that we had here, this is the second meeting that we've had this month for land use. And there was a, not as large a group of people here, but the um, I didn't know this, but the 
I think it's a thir is it SB 3280. There was a, there was a bill that came out of the Senate SB 3280, and then it got past the House. But the bill in the Senate was an agreement between the industry and environmentalists. So if if I, I've never seen the bill, but I know that happened, then it went over to the House. Then the discussion was of a moratorium, but it never got brought up to a vote. So if anybody has the language of what the bill said in the House, I would like to know. And I think that, uh, did you know that that, that, that was an agreement there between the environmentalists and the industry? Did you know that that? Okay, all right. And I don't know what that was. I mean, do you, anybody else know? I, I don't know. Okay, does, does anybody know that in the audience here, though? Yeah. Yes. Okay, all right. Okay. I didn't know. I didn't know about a week ago, so. Two weeks ago. Uh, Jerry, do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. I, I got a, a couple of questions. Uh, Dan mentioned that last, pre we had a presentation from the oil and gas industry uh, representative, and so he made a couple of statements. I wanted to, if, if you had any information on that. One of them was, uh, that more than 30 state and federal regulatory agencies have extensively studied hydraulic fracturing technology. There are zero confirmed cases of groundwater contamination in one million wells fracked over the last 60 years. Do you know if that's, do you have any information on that statement? Zero cases. I, 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 I'm, I'm doubtful. Okay, okay. Um, and let's see. And nevertheless, let's think about if you, if you look at the geological relationship between the groundwater and the shale gas bed, you can assess what the risk is. So the need is for preliminary geological investigation that can weed out where the risks are high. The closer the shale is to the groundwater. Well, the closer, and also what's the intervening strata. If the intervening strata provide a buffer, you're in better shape than if they don't. Um, if you've got groundwater 2,000 feet deep and you've got a shale gas bed 2,500 feet deep, there's a higher risk than what appears to be the situation here where you've got a shale gas bed 4,000 feet deep and what wells there are are nowhere near that deep. And I've seen these industry videos where they show uh, concrete casings uh, in the, in the uh, drilled area to prevent any kind of leakage, that they couple a couple of layers of concrete, which I think says that with the proper uh, uh, safety controls, these risks can be minimized. Okay. Okay. And then um, that we you mentioned the 2005 energy bill. Mr. Rendleman talked about the Safe Drinking Water Act. That I, are there other? I have a listing here other acts that were also loopholes, Clean Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Superfund Act, Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, that all have loopholes for fracking. But then the industry guy said that fracking was never, was never covered by those laws anyway from the beginning. Because it's a new technology. Not, but it, I thought it was decades old. Well, hydraulic fracturing is, but the, but the the shale gas boom, which combines hydraulic fracturing with horizontal drilling, is a new phenomenon that's really not more than about five years old. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah, Mr. From. Uh, oh, so how many questions? You want to take several from the audience? What? All. Just figure it out. Okay. So we'll, I, I guess we have some questions from the audience. Then, Dr. Right. Land. Let's start over here on the right. Yeah, I have two uh, geologic questions for you. One, are you familiar with a recent study that indicates that Illinois ground, the shale cover is about three times more permeable than the new, the Marcellus um, ground? Are you familiar that we might be much more vulnerable than? And the other study I wanted to ask you if you're familiar with is the 1979 uh, IEPA, Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, study on this technology that you said has existed for many years. Um, they found, uh, I, I don't remember the numbers, it's not fresh in my mind, but there were like 4,000 uncapped wellheads from the hydraulic fracturing. The stuff is just leaking because nobody monitors it and Illinois doesn't have the money. So while we can talk about regulation, and that's great, it's not real 
when we're not doing it. And we're already not doing it, so this makes us very nervous. I mean, that you can put concrete casing, but not if you don't monitor it. Not if you don't preserve it for how long? 100 years? How long would we have to monitor it? 100 years? 1,000 years? How does this work? There are a lot of abandoned wells uh, in many areas that are not even known about, no less. And are you also familiar with in some areas where the abandoned wells are, the ground no longer, it, it's, this is salt water, it's very densely salt water, and it's poisoned the ground for agriculture, just like sowing salt into the ground. That in some areas of Illinois, according to the IEPA back in 1979, there are areas, I think it was Clinton County, that have the ground is poisoned for agriculture. You Yes, since uh, this is a huge area for coal, um, and they've been, you know, my, deep mining coal for a long time. I think a hundred years or more around here, right? Um, you can't hear me too well. Uh, yeah. So with all the old coal mines, the deep old coal mines, and some of them like a century old and maybe even older, and the really old ones. Do we know where they all are? And, you know, what is the danger of, you know, drilling into those? Does that add to the um, dangers of the fracking? That's an interesting question. I mean, coal, coal mining had a, I think the law is SMACRA, and Surface Mining Reclamation Act, uh, which was passed, and I couldn't give you the date, but a few decades ago. And there was a lot of coal mines prior to that that were leak acid mine drainage and all the rest. Since that law, uh, current coal mining puts money into a fund to start cleaning up those old abandoned coal mines one at a time. Uh, but there's uh, in the order of 35,000 of them, and they're being cleaned up one at a time. So that leaves a lot of, of pre-law abandoned coal mines. And how they interact with fracking, I don't know. I think you would have to, you know, look at it in a very geographically and geologically specific um, situation of, you know, where are the fracking wells, where are the mines? Do you think the um, USGS and, uh, you know, Illinois Geological Survey, do you think they know where all those mines are? I think there's a good database of abandoned coal mines and the, SM the SMACRA Act uh, has, I, I had a student do a master's thesis using a database called AMLES of 35,000 abandoned coal mines. Um, so I think the data on them is good. Uh, the action is slow. Okay. Another question on this side. Go with this. Um, hi. Um, I uh, wanted to offer just a couple of comments. Maybe you can speak to this more. Um, first is, um, Sorry, this gentleman, I don't know your name. Um, you had said something about contamination with fracking sites, and I wanted to know if, um, and if you could actually speak more to the case in Sublet, Wyoming, where the Federal Environmental Protection Agency did find that water um, from a fracking site was contaminated um, in, with a bunch of fracking chemicals, including um, benzene that was 1,500 times the level considered safe for drinking, benzene being associated with leukemia and other illnesses. So I don't know if this is something you have heard about, but um, I mean, this is something that the EPA has, federal EPA has published. I haven't studied that particular case, but it, does, it d doesn't sound implausible. Um, I have more information on that if you would like to Thank you. I, in your presentation, you said that Pennsylvania was in favor of fracking and there are, I'm sure, some people in Pennsylvania that are in favor of fracking, but I've met quite a few people in Pens from Pennsylvania and in Pennsylvania, I've just recently visited there, and they are not in favor of fracking. In fact, there's a growing opposition. New York is pushing for the ban to stay in place, especially along the border of New York and Pennsylvania. People in New York, I met people from New York who are very frightened that what's happening in Pennsylvania, right on the other side of the state line, will be happening in New York. And I just want to point out, I, I don't think it's correct to say that Pennsylvania is in favor of fracking. They've been fracking there, but there's a growing opposition. 
you were, I think you were referring to the legislature. I, I was referring to there, there is a lot of fracking, have more fracking happening in Pennsylvania than in any other state. Any other questions? Yeah, to clarify one thing um, that uh, Mr. Bost was talking about with um, SB 3280, um, I know, and you said, made the statement that it was an agreement between was, environmental groups and the, the Senate, and they the, the Senate the bill, bill as it came out of the Senate. Mark Willis agreed to SB 3280, and it was passed the House, and before the report came up, question, but it never got. Put up for a vote. I'm not saying that it's not going to happen, but I, you know, I, di I didn't even know there was one passed in the Senate, and I don't know that much about it. But that's what well, I was told. To say that it was an agreement is kind of a fuzzy statement. I have yeah, I just, I just want to clarify that um, the environmentalists saw it as one step in the right direction, oh. and we're saying, okay, this is one step, um, you know, but we want to strengthen it greatly in the house, and, and, and that's question, what was... My, my, my question was, did, did anybody know that that's what that bill was? I, I, I'm sure there was other environmentalists that disagreed with it, but my question was, did anybody know that that did take place in that bill? I didn't know, and I didn't know if anybody else did. That was my question. Uh, Mr. Pabrock. Yeah, um, I wanted to uh, bring up the point of uh, usage of water this gentleman mentioned. We're looking at this new fracking technique using three to five million gallons of water per frack, and any horizontal hydraulic fracking operation can use up to 18 fracking, use fracking up to 18 times. So you're looking at a tremendous amount of water that's taken out of the hydrological cycle. And we want to do this at the time where we're in a long-term drought coming up. Um, the USDA published uh, research on the, on the impact of drought on Illinois and concluded that in, within 15 years, 85% of our counties in Illinois are gonna be in drought, from moderate to severe. We already see what the Im impact is when you know cows don't have uh, grass to eat because their, their grass is dead and the farmers can't grow their corn. It will come down to whether we want this energy, this natural gas, or we want food and, and uh, water for ourselves. It will come down to that. What, you're, you're an expert in water resources. What, what's your thought? Um, Illinois is one of the best endowed states in the Union for water resources. We're bordered by the Ohio River, the Mississippi River, and Lake Michigan. Um, we receive, um, most of the state receives over 40 inches of rain a year. Of course, this is a terrible drought this year. It was a terrible flood last. Um, what I've seen in the climate change models, rather than predicting drought, are predicting wide fluctuations between drought and flood, as we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, both food and energy use enormous amounts of water. 80% um, of all the water withdrawals in Illinois are used to cool off power plants. So the connection between water and energy is enormous no matter what technology you're talking about except wind. We, the, uh, we, we discussed this with the industry uh, representative last, last meeting. And he said there's, there's plenty of water coming through the Rivers. Yeah. Well, he talked about Catch groundwater. Them. Yeah. He, he said they would use groundwater, which I assume meant wells into the into the water table. Did you understand something different? I thought he was talking about just you know out of the rivers. Yeah, I didn't hear. That's a question. Yes. What what is the normal depth of uh, uh, groundwater before it becomes uh, saline? I, I don't think you can generalize. It's it enormous it, variation. 150, 200, 500? Can't generalize. Cool. Enormous variation. Yeah. I'd just like to also state that once that water is used, it's taken out of the hydrological cycle. We're not going to be able to use it for irrigation or food, although they do that in some places, believe it or not. They'll take this polluted water and 
and use it for irrigation, put it on roads. Uh, you brought up, sir, the, uh, the solution of regulations to, to the fracking problem. If we don't have oversight, if we don't have enforcement from the, from the state, which right now the IDNR just laid off, I don't know how many people, 100 people or something. So you're looking at the best case scenario where these guys are gonna come up with regulations to regulate the destruction of the water and have all of these people going around to make sure that the industry doesn't, um, doesn't you know, violate the regulations. But every state that we've seen them in, that's not the case. Every state we've seen them in, they dump the, the toxic water by the side of the road, they put it in the rivers, they dump it in, in wells which are no longer viable. I mean, there is no regulation the way things are set up now. And I just, I want to say that because um, this is not a solution other than we need to ban it until the technology can provide the safeguard of our water and our people, which it can't now. The technology will take the, take the gas out of the ground, but it won't protect anything else once that poison is back up. While you're, Mr. Kibaki, while you're up there, I know you wanted to present some petitions to the, to the board. Do you want to do that now? Yes. yes. I have petitions. We've been collecting them. I'm a member of SAFE, okay. and we've uh, collected 35 pages. It's about 500, over 500 signatures. Okay. Now, what do you want us to do with these, other than know Just note to know that, that there is people okay. in Jackson County and also surrounding counties in Illinois that want to ban the fracking. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, that's obviously a lot of work. Can you record the, uh, what they're signing? Okay. Yes. Uh, this is a petition to ban hydraulic fracturing in Illinois. We, the undersigned, hereby ask for a ban on hydraulic fracturing in the state of Illinois due to the inherent un unreasonable risks posed by this practice to the water, soil, air, health of residents, and future of Illinois, sponsored by Southern Illinoisans Against Fracturing Our Environment. Um, now, is this, this is not the original, it's copies, right? Okay, all right. Okay. And Reverend Sasso had a question. Dr. Light, um, given the, I'm not sure what to call it, but the seismic structure or the the New Madrid Fault and the Lower Wabash Fault. Um, are there equivalent seismic structures like that in areas where fracking has been done widely? And can you comment on fracking in relationship to um, whatever the right term is in terms of its, the faults that were around I don't think I could, I could give you an expert answer to that question, Bill. Um, what I would say is that the regulatory loopholes make it possible to not do the studies that need to be done. Okay, and what is needed in, in a regulatory environment is, is to look before you leap and to evaluate the geological situation before a permit is granted. Okay, and, and, and so there's many questions of this nature where the answer isn't known and yet fracking is going on before the answers are known. And that, that's my concern. Mine too. Okay, we're gonna, Dr. Lant, we really appreciate you coming in uh, and uh, giving us your perspective on this. We've been discussing it at several meetings and we, we appreciate all your expertise and your time today on such short notice. Uh, we're gonna move to the next item on the uh, agenda. Uh, which is correspondence from the Jackson County State's Attorney regarding the uh, uh, potential of uh, uh, zoning, the uh, making it part of uh, countywide zoning policy. What, what, what do we do with this uh, memorandum? Well, first of all, a little bit of history. We tried to let countywide zoning uh, I think it was about 18 years ago. And uh, it came very close to President, but it failed. And there's general opposition, especially in the rural areas, to any kind of reservation of land other than what the owners are willing to exercise on their own. This part of my perspective, uh, I don't have a chance. 
Oh, can I can I want me to relate that some of that? The, the, the county tried uh, for countywide zoning about 18 years ago. In in your senior recollection of that time. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and there was a lot of opposition, especially in the rural areas, to to having that kind of regulation. Uh, in order to exercise zoning authority, you have to have in the state of Illinois a countywide zoning plan. We don't have that. We don't have countywide zoning. Hollandale has zoning within a mile and a half strip around the city of Hollandale. Nothing's built for exercise zoning in that area, but it chooses not to. So there's a no man's land on the outskirts of, of Nothing's Bill, where the city could exercise zoning authority, but it chooses not to do that. As of the next two areas, there is no zoning. And that's the problem. And there can't be unless there is a thousand wild zoning order. So, uh, yeah, absent a countywide zoning ordinance, a, a zoning plan, the only areas that have zoning are the cities of Carbondale and Murfreesboro, and Murfreesboro chooses not even to exercise their uh, area around them. My understanding is that the small municipality could obtain that right if they chose it. But then, reflecting the rules as a person about any kind of outside resolution, the likelihood of that is just not good. Anything else about the uh, state's attorney uh, memorandum? Uh, I was just going to share that uh, with that, you know, because the opinion from the state's attorney was that we don't have the authority to do it. It's a state issue. But with that, I I, I want to ask a question to is Richard Whitney. Yes. Do, if some if there was a uh, to get a referendum on a statewide uh, election ballot or whatever, what what question would need to be posed on that so the the that question could be posed in front of the, the public so they could vote on it? I mean, how many signatures would be required for something like that? Uh, or would two, that well, there's two different kinds of referenda in the state of Illinois. One would be advisory and one would be binding. For a binding one that would actually pass a law, it is extremely difficult. I, I can't remember the percentage, but it's something like 5% of the people who vote in the last race for governor. So I remember a few years ago when there was an effort to get one, it was 200,000 maybe, Barb, you might remember, with the League of Women Voters. Right. It was a huge number. With the right. method for um, outlining the district. Right. It, 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 was, it, it was six figures easy, uh, valid signatures that you, that you would need to gather. So that's why, unlike other states like California, where they frequently have statewide referenda, it's extremely difficult to do that in Illinois. Yeah, I wonder why they haven't set up that way. It's kind of. I mean, you think I that, you know, it's either go, it either goes through your legislators or it gets done, but it's not. It can't get blocked once once a petition has got the proper number of signatures and gets presented. They can't stop it. It has to go on the on the ballot, right? That's true. If okay. if, if you do gather that, then it goes on the ballot. Yeah, I mean, that's your right. I mean, that's our political freedom. So a lot of people don't know that. They think that you can just be pushed around all the time. And you don't have to do that. You can get the signatures. So I don't know what you're doing with the signatures. But they may it may be need, need to be worded differently than what it is right here. If you want to put that up for a vote, you know what I'm saying? I, well, I'm just I'm just I, I don't know. I mean, I, you well, know. could there be a referendum in Jackson County? Well, but how many? How it, that many? could only be advisory. Uh, advisory. I, I, I think. Well, I have to say, check that this board could do that. But oh. but yeah, I don't think there's no process by which a county referendum could be made state law could be made law in the county that I'm aware of. All right, and would this be a good time? I know you have arguments. You, you gave us your memorandum uh, in response to the state's attorney's opinion last time. Would you want to? If, if I may, yeah. I, I would appreciate that. And I, I did provide members of this committee with uh, copies of the memorandum and some additional copies for those who aren't present. And I want to thank the committee for this opportunity to respond. I'm not going to read through the whole memorandum since you have it. I just want to highlight a few things. 
Um, first of all, let me just say in general that I understand and appreciate that uh, Attorney Brenner being an assistant state's attorney, obviously his opinion will necessarily carry some weight. Uh, but I think it's also important for this, this committee to understand that someone that, that is uh, speaking from the state's attorney's office, I think is naturally going to have a tendency to err on the side of caution. Uh, and, and that may be coloring part of, of the opinion it came to. But the Southern, Southern Illinoisans Against Fracture and Environment has a legal committee that looked at this extensively and, if, and you'll see there were actually two of us that wrote this but there were uh, six uh, attorneys who signed this and, and, and looked at this and agree with this statement, statement that we provided you. Basically, Attorney Brenner made several points in coming to the conclusion that counties don't have the authority to ban fracking. The first is that Jackson County is not a home rule, rule unit of government. And basically our response to that is that doesn't matter. The uh, statutes that we cited in our model ordinance are not confined to home rule units. They, they apply to all counties in the state of Illinois. So the fact that Jackson County is not home ruled is not relevant to this analysis. And as a matter of fact, we even quote this one enabling statute that applies to two of these other statutes that says it's the policy of the state that all powers uh, uh, affects and competition and it includes non-home rule counties. So, and, and you can read the analysis more, more fully in here, but, but basically that point is simply not relevant to what we're proposing to this board. But it wasn't his point about home rule that if you're, if you're not a home rule unit of government, you're only allowed to exercise the authority granted you by the state of Illinois. Right, and, and my, our response to that is all these things that we've cited in my, my model ordinance are granted to all counties in the state of Illinois, non-home rule or home rule. So it doesn't matter. You have the, you, you, it's expressly granted that, that power, even the one about water pollution, that applies to all counties. The only caveat I'd add to that is that the water pollution statute would require a two-thirds vote of the county board to, uh, to bring that section under, in line. But you do not have to be a home rule unit. That is, that is simply not correct to, to, to do that. Um, I'm, I'm just a little confused. Sure, I'm sorry. You're saying the ordinance has provisions which can be enacted whether or not you're home rule or non-home rule. Correct. And I thought his point was that the, the Illinois legislature requires you, if you are, are not home rule, you can only do use enumerated powers. They're not, they're not referring to that ordinance, they're referring to the Illinois state statute. Right? No, it's, it, home rule has much greater authority to uh, act on certain things, but that does not mean that a non-home rule county doesn't have powers that are necessarily implied from the grant of additional authority. I mean, they, they, they can overstep their bounds, clearly, but uh, but I, I think as his memo makes clear, um, the state bans murder, but it doesn't describe how, it doesn't describe each, uh, each way you could murder somebody and, and yeah. still be liable. And I, I think the point here is that the, the powers that have been granted to all counties with respect to public health and safety and some other things, I haven't read it all, en encompass the authority to make some provision uh, presumably for a fracking. Right? Yeah. Let, let me explain it this way. There, in the state of Illinois adopted this whole thing called the county's code, and it's quite extensive. And in the county's code, code there's different divisions, and some of them apply to only home rule counties, and some do not. What we're saying is that the three uh, statutes that we say give counties the authority to regulate in this area uh, are in the sections of the county's code that apply to non-home ruled counties. So yes, this county would have the authority based on it. Um, the second point that Attorney Brenner made was that the sections of the county's code upon which the model ordinance relies don't mention hydraulic fracturing. And there again, our response is that's not relevant. They, don't, they give counties broad powers 
to, in, in fact, two of them use the phrase, do all acts and make all regulations necessary to promote public health, abate air contaminants, and prevent pollution of any body of water. So it's very broad. And of course, they don't have to anticipate, as uh, Attorney Rendleman was just pointing out, uh, to, you know, to, to foresee and, and, and state in the statute every kind of air contaminant or every kind of water pollutant. It doesn't have to spell that out. So the fact that it doesn't mention hydraulic fracturing, which was just pointed out, this kind is, what, five years old, we just learned. Uh, of course, that, that doesn't bar counties from using those parts of the code. Point three uh, Attorney Brenner made is that the city of Carlisle case doesn't support county authority to ban fracking because it was a municipal ordinance based on zoning. And I guess that was part of what uh, preceded the, the discussion we just had on zoning. And his point was, well, we don't have zoning authority and we're not under the municipal code. Well, that's true, but we didn't cite the city of Carlisle case for that purpose. We realized that it's a different case, different situation, and, and, but we're not, we never claimed that the city of Carlisle uh, case was binding or mandatory authority. We claimed it's persuasive authority and is. The significance of the case is that uh, here in the 5th District Appellate Court, where a city did ban it, they said it, it, it wasn't preempted by state law. And so, granted, that doesn't make it a slam dunk that if someone were to challenge this ordinance that the appellate court would come to the same conclusion, but it makes it more likely than not that the appellate court would come to the same conclusion. Um, point four, uh, Attorney Brenner said that existing state statutes and regulations governing drilling, water pollution, and air pollution preempt county authority to regulate in this area. And now this is the most, uh, I think, the uh, argument that at least has some force. We do have to be concerned about preemption. Uh, and what, what preemption basically means is that when the federal government regulates in a certain area, it can preempt states or local governments from doing certain things in that same area. Or when the state regulates in a certain area, it can preempt counties and local governments from doing things in the same area. However, there's rules regarding preemption. And as I point out in this memo, there's basically three kinds of preemption. There is express preemption. And that is when the state says explicitly, you county and local governments are, are barred from enacting any ordinances in this area of the law, right? But that, that hasn't happened. That does not apply here at all. Then there's two kinds of implied preemption. One's called conflict preemption. And that's where you know, there is a direct conflict that you can point to between this reg state regulation and this county ordinance. Well, in that case, the state would trump the county and it would be preempted for that reason. Well, that doesn't apply here. And the reason it doesn't apply here is because the state isn't regulating fracking. The only regulations that even remotely uh, pertain to fracking is that uh, when, when a company wants to drill, they have to get a permit from IDNR and our understanding is they don't even, IDNR doesn't even ask them if they're going to be conducting fracking. They just ask if they're going to be drilling. And, and so it, 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 there, there's no meaningful regulation from the state of Illinois whatsoever when it comes to fracking. So the third kind, the one that might possibly have an argument, is this thing called free field preemption. And as I give the quote from the Illinois uh, Appellate Court here, that occurs where the legislature enacts such a comprehensive scheme of regulations as to reasonably imply that there is no room for additional regulation by local municipalities or, or counties. Well, by, by force of the same argument I just made, I think that, that anyone challenging an ordinance like this would be on really shaky grounds because how could you say that there's comprehensive scheme of regulations when there's virtually no regulation? So I, I think we win on field preemption too. I, I think, you know, there, there's no guarantees under the law, but, but, you know, if I were to bet on this, uh, I'd say, you know, 10 to 1 odds that, that we would win on any challenge based on free, field preemption easily. Um, so that's that one. And then finally, uh, Attorney Brenner made the point that he admitted he was not an expert on federal preemption, but said we may need to be concerned about federal preemption as well. 
But as we point out, no, actually we don't, because uh, as was, was pointed out, uh, in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, Congress basically wrote fracking out of law and exempted it from protection under the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. There is no meaningful federal regulation of fracking either. Um, so, you know, we have a laissez-faire system basically when it comes to fracking. There, the, neither the state or the, uh, the federal government is regulating this area. We're very confident that if this county were to pass the model ordinance and if it were challenged, that we could survive a challenge in the, in the federal court and, and if necessary, the Illinois Supreme Court. One other thing I would, I would point out is that maybe it's kind of an unspoken thing, but you know, there's always this underlying concern, well, we might get, if we pass this, we might get sued. And yes, the county might get sued if somebody wanted to come in and do fracking, but guess what? Counties have local governmental tort immunity from paying any damages. So the worst thing that could happen to Jackson County if it were to pass this ordinance is it would get challenged in court, but the challenge in court would be limited to striking down the ordinance. The county would not be liable for any damages. No, no money to be paid out. Insurance doesn't have to, you know, to, to kick in except possibly for, for defense. And I would assume the state's attorney's office would, would defend. And I might add, you have a, a small squadron of lawyers that would be right here in SAFE that would be willing to assist Jackson County gladly in, the, in, in defense of, of this ordinance. So if, if we're talking about weighing the risks of acting versus the risks of not acting, well, the risks of acting are going to be minimal. The, the ordinance gets struck down. All right, we tried, we lost. Meanwhile, we protected our county for as long as it takes the court challenge to, to uh, continue. But the risks of not acting are, are grave indeed for the reasons that have been presented by uh, other speakers from SAFE at two meetings ago or whenever that was, and, and the tremendous amount of material and evidence that we presented that you can find on the SAFE website that this, in our view, is, is at least at present, is an inherently unsafe technology. Uh, and as Mr. Paprocki pointed out that, uh, you know, maybe sometime in the future if they can demonstrate that it, it can be done safely, the county can always reevaluate. But, but for right now, the, the, the potential risks and the severity of those risks far outweigh any illusory benefits. Another question. Yeah. Now you're talking about, you're not talking about the fracturing that has occurred since 1950, you're talking about this new high volume fracturing. Right, right. And, okay. and the model ordinance that we drafted specifies that because it talks about, okay. it defines fracking as the horizontal drilling plus the use of the chemicals. Okay. Zoning classification yeah, is no fracking in the county. I don't know. I don't. I mean, can you put that question out there? I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer. Well, you could, but also, I mean, uh, I mean, you know, we're the board. Okay. You know, the board. No, 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 the board. The board can not, decide. Not yeah. The board decide to put it. You're all about the referendums put, today. Put a referendum. Two hundred thousand people have said it. No, 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 no. I'm talking about Jackson County. I know. I know. I'm talking about Jackson County. So, Mr. Chairman, if I may, Chairman Pro Tem, <laughs> this matter has to go before the full board, and and I think uh, uh, I think we owe it to everybody here and the guy from the oil and gas industry uh, that this be a matter that be acted upon by the full board, and uh, given the fact that that I don't think I mean, we we four can't decide this issue on our own, uh, that this has to be a matter for the full board, uh, I would make a motion uh, that we recommend that the full board consider the options of an absolute ban, the support of the moratorium, or no action at all, 
and, and that this matter be put on the agenda for the next board meeting presented by the land use committee. Because I don't, I, I think we got to quit kicking it back and forth to committee. Okay. Is there a motion on the floor? Is there a second? Second by Mr. Conner. Uh, let's have a little discussion on this. There, I thought we were talking at one point about Mr. Whitney and Mr. Brenner getting together. That was, something, that was something that was recommended by, by Mr. Brenner in a message to me. Okay. And uh, I would say, let's do that. You know, anything that can expand our knowledge and anything that will let the, uh, the public wants us to be, will be helpful. Okay, so how does that, uh, their meeting then time out in relation to this motion to put it before the full board? Well, the full board meeting is until August 21st. What is it? 21st. 21st, so we have uh, almost four weeks in which uh, the, the state's attorney's office and, and the uh, attorneys for SAFE and, and, you know, any other attorneys who have an opinion, which I guess is everyone in the world, but, uh, can, can consider uh, truly what the, uh, they may not come to agreement, but they may be able to uh, address the issues and, and who knows, maybe they will come to agreement on the authority of the county and can advise the board and we're not obligated to do what any attorney says for that matter. And, and, and perhaps uh, securing an opinion from the Attorney General may be the, the appropriate way to go. But I think this has to go to the full board and, and these people who've been showing up, what, three, four times now, uh, they're entitled to a decision. Do you, uh, do you um, Mr. Whitney, are you you're amenable to meeting with Mr. Brenner? And oh, absolutely. Okay, yeah. and then would you, uh, uh, I think it would be helpful for the, Mr. Brenner and Mr. Whitney to make their arguments then to the full board at that the legal arguments on this issue at that point, and however they wish to do it. And um, just just so I understand your motion, your your motion is to basically take the issue to the full board. You're not making a recommendation as to whether there should be a moratorium. You're not suggesting that well, the committee. I have my own opinion, but I, I think it's something that heard the most evidence and have pondered it the most, don't you think the Land Use Committee should make a recommendation to the full board, just like we do in all other matters? Yes, I do. I don't know that we would have a consensus here, but... You know. I, I think it's, it's enthusiastic, but I also think it's important for the other members of the board to hear the expressions of opinion, both from Mr. Miller, from the attorneys, and from anybody who has an opinion one way or another. And then what do them decide? Well, I don't know why you just don't take it to in, in a refer. I mean, you talk to people and they say, if you ask them, are you for fracking or are you for against it? Somebody says, I don't like it. Another person says, I don't care. Another person says, I don't know. If you ask them, are you for clean di drinking water or dirty drinking water, it's pretty clear. But the thing is, is why can't you just, what is wrong with, you know, you can put a referendum on the ballot pretty quick whether the county will vote on whether they're for high high volume fracking or not. And I know it's only, I know it's only a, you said it doesn't, it's, advisory. it's only advisory, but isn't that important to know what Jackson County is thinking? I mean, do you, don't you think that's important? I mean, I, I'm just, you know, maybe, you know, I may not get an agreement here on this committee or anybody else, but. I think it's a fundamental right of citizens to petition their government. And they can go with a referendum if they believe the government is not acting but I think the citizens have, have petitioned their government and, and we have an obligation to act. We're their representatives. Yeah. And I just have a question about the advisory, the ref, back on the referendum thing, whether, so you, there can't be a referendum to enact an ordinance. What about that? Is that right, there, it would not have any power of law. Only the, only the... And I'm not even sure about the advisory. I mean, I, I'd have to look into that. I know that that there is a procedure where townships can put it on the ballot. I'm not even sure if a county board can put it on the ballot. I assume that there's a way to do that. But, you know, I'd have to research that one and I'm 
I'd be willing to okay, do that. Okay, we're discussing Mr. Rendleman's motion. Uh, so are these comments related to the motion? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Friend. One constructive thing that might be to amend the motion or to think about is that Attorney General's opinion. You have to ask, you probably know this. You, we can't ask for an Attorney General's opinion. But if the state's attorney, if the county wanted to ask for an opinion, they could get it. And I think the Attorney General would like to give an opinion if you asked. Uh, and, and that may be the decision of the county board to uh, uh, request that its state's attorney get an opinion from the Attorney General. Yes. My comment relates to Mr. Boss's suggestion, and that is just that there are a lot of people who don't know what fracking is. And you guys have had the opportunity over the last month to learn a lot about it. For a lot of your constituents, they don't know. I think it's very unfair to put it to them as a vote when you are here to protect your constituents. Uh, I'm going to... If there's no more discussion, I think we can vote on the motion. Would you mind restating your motion for the record? So it's uh, more about that I, what was it, Michelle? Did you write it down? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you were more or less passing this issue to the full board to consider the options. Well, well, absolute let me, banning. We're not hunting. The, the, the land use committee recommends that the full county board consider the issue of fracking and in particular consider banning it to consider supporting the General Assembly's consideration of a moratorium to consider uh, permitting it without regulation Or to, con or, or to seek an attorney general's opinion, the attorney general's opinion on the authority of the, of the county to enact fracking legislation short of zoning, which I think is... is other than zoning. Other, other than zoning. Um, thanks for restating that motion. I, I've just, it's been seconded. Okay. I just want to uh, just explain how I'm going to vote on this. I believe that we as a committee should have, a, should make a recommendation to the board. So I'm, I'm going to oppose that motion. But uh, if there's no more discussion, I think we'll take a vote on it. All in favor of Mr. Rendleman's motion, say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion passes and will be presented at the August 21st. Uh, board meeting. You're not going to be there, right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, what is your position? Well, I don't think it's going to come to a vote at that point. I mean, we're going to have legal arguments and the board's going to hear the arguments. I bet they take a Oh, well. I have to work that uh, night. Okay. Going to item B on the agenda, which is an uh, issue involving the floodplain ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Whitney, for your argument. Yeah, I, I, I look forward to reading your memorandum. All right, thank you. And the tri-power case. Mr. Mr. White. We're waiting for more. Reasons.